We, we thank you all for, for being part of this. Uh, I wanted to just uh, take a few minutes of your time to give you a, a brief um, overview of what has been accomplished uh, since the creation of the Housing Task Force in August of uh, 2017. So as you know, the mayor uh, mentioned, uh, there are five um, individuals that comprise the task force. Uh, Jim Bailey, Maria Antonieta Mediosabal, Jean Dawson Jr., and Noah Garcia. We uh, have um, created a process that enables us to have um, public meetings every other week where information uh, is presented to the task force that will inform our policy uh, priorities. Uh, and these public meetings are also a great opportunity to hear directly from a uh, community. And so this is not the first uh, community meeting that we're having. This is the first large scale uh, community and public meeting. Uh, but throughout the course of our process, uh, we have been um, uh, hearing directly from uh, you know, many of you that are here today and others that couldn't be with us. And I wanted to just you know, emphasize that you know, the community engagement piece is really uh, critical to the success of our task force. We can look at data, we can look at history, we can look at best practices, but if, um, if, if our recommendations don't reflect what is happening on the ground, then I don't think that those recommendations will be um, you know, really based on reality. And so that's you know, why uh, we're all gathered uh, today. Uh, and this is also an opportunity for you all to you know, provide uh, feedback to us on the, um, the vision that we have set out and the mission or the specific sort of tangible steps uh, or actionable steps that we hope to accomplish at the end of this process. The first thing that I, you know, uh, the first thing that I, uh, that I think is important for me to point out from the vision statement is this uh, opening statement that reads, San Antonio will be a place of opportunity for all current and future residents where people have a right to place and, a, and to meaningful participation in the decisions that impact the lives and the places, their lives or the places where they live. Um, and you know, really the vision is that everyone will have a place to call home. Everyone will have a place that they can afford. Uh, we, you know, when we talk about housing affordability or affordable housing, I think it's important, you know, uh, for us to be reminded of what, what does that mean. That means that, you know, family that is um, able to um, afford a place where they're not paying more than 30% of their income is able to have a sense of stability, a sense of um, ability to be able to pay for the other expenses that are necessary to, um, to help um, you know, their family. And so we're always sort of mindful that at the, as part of this process, we're thinking about everyone and making sure that, as the mayor said, that you know, people have a place to live with dignity. Uh, and so that is the vision that we have set out for ourselves. Uh, we welcome your input and we welcome your feedback. Uh, moving on to the, um, the mission statement, uh, and these are basically um, the objectives or the, uh, what we have set out you know, to do as part of this process. One is that, as I mentioned, that our process will be grounded in making sure that we're using data to inform the recommendations that we develop, but also uh, looking across the country to see how other cities are addressing uh, some of the challenges that they see, and then uh, creating uh, opportunities to hear directly from uh, community members uh, like you all today. So the mayor's you know, uh, policy making process will be grounded in community, uh, in data, in best practices, and making sure that you know, this is an inclusive community engagement approach. Uh, we will gather information um, from various experts, uh, residents, and housing stakeholders. And at the end of the day, um, we will um, make sure to delivering a comprehensive, compassionate uh, housing framework. So we can, so how are we going to get there? Wow, I'm 
feeling uh, I'm feeling a little nervous because um, really, uh, you know, this is a, a, a very uh, historical uh, time I think for us to be gathered here today and to to have um, a focus on housing like it's never uh, been had before. Um, I would just share with you that you know I've been in the housing and community development world for maybe about 20 years. And housing always seems to be kind of the last thing that people um, think about. We talk about employment, we talk about education, uh, we talk about access to social services, but we rarely talk about housing in the way that I think we need to talk about housing, right? We need to ensure that um, when we are thinking about education and health or employment, that we're thinking about um, the ability for individuals to be able to have housing that is affordable, housing that is of quality, housing that allows for people to be able to thrive, housing that allows for people to be able to feel safe, um, housing that allows for people to be able to say that this is my home, this is, this is the place where I come to, uh, to be myself, where I come to rest, where I come to refuel. Uh, and you know, it's, it's really incredible to see you all here because I think you all recognize that in order for our city to be able to um, address the challenges that are in front of us and ahead of us, both from, um, you know, in terms of population growth, we know that the city is growing um, at a very rapid pace. Um, one of our experts you know, during um, the courts of the uh, public uh, meetings that we have had shared with us that by 2040, this uh, city will be um, growing uh, by a million people. So by 2040, you know, we will have a million new residents. Um, and that's you know, both a result of just natural uh, growth but also migration that is coming in. So how do we you know, stay ahead of the game? How do we ensure that as our city grows, that you know, we are uh, growing housing um, to ensure that everyone has the ability to have a place that is affordable, accessible, and safe? Uh, so, so thank you all again for being part of this conversation and discussion. And as we go through this process, you know, we have mapped out a timeline that we um, hope will get us to developing this comprehensive housing plan. And it you know, started um, with our meetings in October. Uh, we are now in this uh, month of December having our first community public meeting. Uh, we hope to be able to have two more community public meetings before the final presentation of our, our plan, which is scheduled for uh, May of 2018. And uh, throughout you know, the course of uh, this process, we want to ensure that the information that we are gathering, the recommendations that we, are, um, or that, that we intend to make, uh, that they are transparent, that you all have an opportunity to weigh in. Uh, so we have uh, created a, a website uh, that allows for you to track um, the information that uh, the task force is um, not only um, contemplating or discussing, but also that will allow you to provide um, feedback uh, to all of us. Uh, and then just the last, you know, um, the last thing that I will uh, also share with you that is um, yet another sort of opportunity and way for, um, for you to continue to be involved in helping us come up with solutions is through uh, the creation of what we have called technical working uh, groups. In this process, um, in the last three months, we've heard from a number of experts and from a number of you know, city staff members about some of the key challenges and key opportunities as it relates to housing. And collectively, the task force has come up with these five broad areas of focus. We think that these, by focusing on these five broad areas, that we will be able to um, move the needle on housing and make a significant impact. But we want to test that with you all, of, uh, with all of you today. We want to, you know, um, ensure that we have not left anything behind. And so as part of your discussions within the table, uh, you'll have an opportunity to let us know whether we're on point, 
missing something. Um, and so your information, the discussions that will be had today will inform not only um, the overall process, but uh, it, they will also inform these five you know, policy areas that, that are of interest to us and that we intend to focus on. And so let me share those uh, five areas. Uh, the first area is um, making sure that we understand the housing situation for special populations. And that includes um, individuals that are homeless, individuals that are chronically homeless, individuals that are aging out of the foster care system that need a place to be able to transition to, to be independent, but may require uh, supportive services. And so we're very interested in, in understanding how big is this problem? What are the um, opportunities? Who's providing supportive housing in our city? What do we need to do to expand um, housing availability and opportunity that ties services to ensure that special populations are being served? So if you're interested in that um, area of uh, focus, um, please you know, weigh in, let us know uh, what ideas or solutions you may have. The second area of uh, focus for us is uh, looking at the coordination of a uh, housing system that allows for us to better understand housing, how many housing units are being produced, how are dollars being um, invested or utilized, are we uh, maximizing, do we have an effective way of you know, making sure that the dollars that are coming in, uh, private dollars, federal dollars, you know, state dollars, that those dollars are um, truly aligned to producing the maximum number of units. Um, we have good data within the city, but quite frankly, we don't have a coordinated in and integrated housing system across the city. It's hard to, um, to go to one place to figure out, you know, how many units are we producing for families that you know, make below $20,000 a, a year? It, or how many units are, um, are uh, available for individuals that want to buy their first house? And what does it take? Uh, who's producing housing and who's providing housing counseling? We don't have that information in one place. And so our hope is to be able to look at how other cities you know, may be uh, addressing this and then opportunities you know, to partner with the nonprofits, for-profits, and um, uh, private you know, developers that are interested in strengthening and developing an integrated and coordinated housing system. The, the third area of focus is uh, looking at financing uh, or funding um, sources that are available um, to create and to further or expand um, affordable housing opportunities. And this is not just looking at you know, funding sources uh, from across the, um, the federal and state government, but also looking at some of the creative um, things that are happening in communities um, where um, you know, small um, scale uh, investment is, is occurring and there are some you know, innovative and creative ways of bringing in um, dollars you know, to make that happen. And as an example, I'll share with you that you know, we're very interested in um, better understanding the pilot uh, housing um, uh, program that has been developed by Councilwoman Shirley Gonzalez in District 5. We think it's a very innovative way of bringing community developers, uh, the university, um, and you know, the nonprofits together to, um, to address you know, housing uh, availability, housing rehab, and also home ownership opportunities. So that's you know, the third area of focus for us. Um, the fourth area of focus, um, or the themes that have emerged, is that we can not produce enough housing simply by thinking about public dollars. There's not enough funding that is coming in to be able to address the large demand and need. Um, and you know, as many of you know, uh, or those that have been tracking the federal budget, uh, there's, you know, um, plans to continue to cut those dollars even more uh, from public housing to Section 8 and home and CDBG. And so we have to think about the private sector and um, the opportunities to bring in um, private sector, private development. Uh, and so 
you know, we recognize that, that, that there's a tremendous opportunity for private developer, de developers to come in, but we also recognize that there are some barriers, right, that need to be addressed in order to facilitate further development, and that uh, there are also some um, uh, priorities that need to be made um, at a community level to ensure that we're mitigating the impact that this has to uh, communities. So that's our fifth area of focus. Our fifth uh, area of focus is ensuring that we understand uh, issues of displacement, displacement issues of gentrification, what, you know, the impact that uh, development is having in communities, how do we protect the character and the history of neighborhoods while also recognizing that there are residents that are looking for housing and are moving into neighborhoods. I don't think we have had a very um, focused, honest conversation about this issue as a community. And this is our opportunity to be able to, to have that and to hopefully uh, be more proactive. Um, you know, in, in some communities across the country, they are so far to the other end that it's so difficult to, um, to, to rescue neighborhoods, right? Um, from LA to New York, uh, to San Francisco, to Portland, right? You know, there are some communities that were not proactive, that did not address this early on. And I think for us, you know, um, in here in San Antonio, we know, we recognize that there are some neighborhoods that are being impacted by this. And, you know, we know that that is affecting residents and, and the fabric of community. But I also believe that it is not, um, that, we're, that we are um, in time to be able to address it in a way that is thoughtful, in a way that, you know, allows for us to have a balance. Um, a, a balance both in terms of protecting uh, neighborhoods, but also a balance in terms of providing uh, opportunity for um, for new residents that are coming in. So those are the, the five sort of big themes that have emerged in the last three months. Those are the five areas of focus that the task force is grappling with. Um, as I mentioned, we um, don't um, we don't know everything. We may be missing some things. We are looking you know, to hear directly from, um, from you all um, in terms of are these the five areas that are the most critical? Are we missing something? Um, as you think about these five areas, is there something there that um, I didn't mention or that you, know, we, you all think is really important uh, that, that the task force, uh, task force uh, considers? Uh, so the opportunity to have that level of input will be while you're um, having the um, table discussions, but also at the end of the meeting, there is a comment card that each of you will receive and you'll be able to provide us you know, that level of feedback. And so I think I've, I've talked enough um, and um, I thank you all so much again for, for being here. Uh, we are going to go ahead and kick off um, today's uh, public meeting uh, with um, a panel presentation. Um, as I mentioned, you know we, uh, you know we're, we want to ensure that this process is informed by what's happening on the ground, and so um, Linda uh, Jimenez from Jimenez and Associates, who I did not recognize early on, but Linda Jimenez uh, from Jimenez and Associates and her entire team, thank you for organizing all of this, and thank you for. Um, Staying true to the the vision that you know the task force has as it relates to um, having a, a this community um, engagement process that was you know grounded in stories and the experiences that uh, people uh, have and so I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, Linda Jimenez to introduce our first um, panel uh, conversation before we begin the conversations at the table. Thank you. This, the panel this morning, as uh, Lourdes mentioned, is to give you all a, a, some experiences, as she says, on the ground. People are going to talk about their, very, their own personal experiences with housing. Some of them have been relatively successful, others have been really struggling. It just really depends on, and we, we have a fairly good range of experiences, I think. 
what we wanted to do with this panel was to introduce the ideas, some of the, some of the range of experiences, because I know that a lot of you all here have had a lot of different experiences with alcohol. And so we kind of wanted just to, to begin to, to talk about what this might be. We're just going to do this. The, our first panelist then is Walter Perry, and he's going to speak to you uh, about the, the, his acquiring a home and what that was like for him. Uh, good morning, everyone. How y'all doing? Uh, first, I want to say thank you for allowing us to be here on the panel, and also thank you to uh, Mary Nordberg for putting on the mirror. And Ms. Lourdes, thank you. Can I just keep it real with y'all? The process was hard. I'm from, the, I'm from the east side of San Antonio. So if anybody knows about that area, you know it's a very challenging area. However, I was working for a economic development uh, agency a couple years ago. And working in the east side, you would wanna, uh, you would wanna believe that the dream is for you too. Especially if you're working in that neighborhood. I grew up there and I kept going around asking our leadership, how can I get a house? You know, I'm seeing everybody getting houses inside my neighborhood. And they were like, well, there's no houses for you. I'm like, what do you mean there's no houses for me? I see houses everywhere. Well, these houses are not for you. And so, I, you know, I didn't want to accept that answer. So my wife and I, you know, she's from New Orleans, uh, Louisiana. She came after Katrina. So she knows about hard times. And me growing up on the east side, I know about hard times, so we were a perfect fit with each other. We already knew we wanted to get a house, but she had four kids come into a relationship, I had four kids come into a relationship, so that's eight kids together that we have, and I split up. So not only taking care of each other, we're taking care of eight kids. We're trying to go to school. We're trying to have a career. We just want to be somebody. And why not have a home? Why not have a home for eight kids? Well, I went back to my former employer. I was like, hey, you know, there's a chance for us to get a house. Can you help us out? Can you, like, I, I know you know some people, some lenders, or somebody, and I've been working in this community. Everybody who knows me on the inside knows that I'm very diligent in that community. And my former employer told my wife and I, nobody told y'all to have those eight kids. Well, I'm not there anymore, so that's a form of employment. But anyway, I met someone uh, during that time. Her name is Dahlia. Dahlia, can you stand up? She's from Crockett. Crockett National. That, that's my friend. Okay. I was downtown at the library working at my former employer, advertising. This is an economic development agency designed to help Eastsiders, right? So I'm representing this country, I mean that country, this company, saying that we're going to help you, but at the same time, I'm not being helped. So after I got done, Dahlia walked up to me. I didn't know who she was. She said, I have two million dollars I need to give away. Do you want a house? I was like, yeah, I want a house. I was like, who are you? So we got to talking and she was like, look, I can help you get a house. I can show you everything you do, but you need to do exactly what I'm telling you to do. And I, and I went home and I told my wife, and she talked to Daddy, and she was like, yeah, let's do it. So we did everything Daddy told us to do. Daddy stuck with us. She said, don't do this, pay that. Don't do this, do this, do this. And she stuck with us and, and got us pre approved And then on top of that, we got the loan through Daddy, but we hit a roadblock. That was a house on the east side in the Choice Footprint. Now, according to the Choice Footprint, they supposed to have funding for houses for home repair. Well, when I went to the city or whoever was involved, they said that that funding is not for you. That funding is for somebody else who has a lot more money, who's in a higher tax bracket. I'm like, well, I'm a resident of the east side. And I don't know about y'all, but marriage is a business. And if we don't, marriage is a business. And if we don't have what we need to have to fix our homes, then we're not gonna be able to do what we need to do. And to make a long story short, we got the house. Home ownership is what it is. Don't clap yet. We've been in this home since May of 2016. 
When we moved in, there's no AC unit. We still, we've been living in the cold, living in the heat right now. So we, we don't even have an AC unit or a heat unit in our house. So we're investors just like a business is. And before I close, I just want to say one more thing. The power of home ownership for somebody who came as, who, who was renting his whole life, watching my grandma pay rent, watching my mama pay rent, I never seen anybody pay a mortgage. And for me to go pay a mortgage, it, it not only compelled me to look at my son and feel like I was worth something, but it compelled me to get back into college. And right now I'm getting ready to graduate with my business degree because Dahlia inspired me to want to be somebody. So I just want to tell everybody before I close, no matter what your income is, if you have somebody that's very important to you, stick by them and just keep pushing and God is going to bless you. Thank you. That was very inspiring. Thank you, Walter. Uh, our next speaker is Terry Lind Linda, Linda Wood. Linda Wood, I'm sorry. I can, I can, the Linda part, I can write. But <laughs> and he is going to talk to you about a permanent, a permanent supportive housing for veterans. Hi, my name is Terry Linda Wood. I'm 62. I'm a veteran. And, um, I've gone through a lot of process getting to where I'm at right now. I um, lost my job the last part of 14, and I ended up being evicted. And when I was evicted, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to um, GI Forum. When I went to GI Forum, they did everything they could to help me. They got me into an apartment, and they helped me with the rent, the utilities, everything. I mean, it's a part of that supportive housing, permanent supportive housing, that is so very important for a lot of people. Uh, once I was done with that, uh, my caseworker with my the, uh, veterans uh, section eight. I was, I was taken in. I got an apartment in the same complex. I had to move, but I got another apartment in the same complex. So it wasn't a big task. What they did for me was huge. They took me in, they worked with me, they did whatever they had to do to get me a place to live permanently. Permanent support of housing. I'm an advocate for it because it works so well for me. And it should work for those that are out there looking for housing. I mean, there are a lot of homeless people out there that are looking for a place to live. And they don't know what the process is to get through that. So they need people to reach out, or they need to reach out as well. Because I'm an advocate for this, it works. And I'm proof that it works. And I'm happy where I'm at. I'm happy where I live. I'm comfortable. <clears throat> it's good for me. It, it became very good for me. And uh, I'm a lot happier than what I was. So. step by step, whatever I had to do. I went to classes, I filled out applications, I talked to different people that would help me. So it's something that we need to concentrate on to help these people out there that are, that are struggling, that are on the corners, that have no place to go. They need our help. And I don't know exactly what that help could be, or what those steps could be, but it's important that we help these people to find housing where they can be a lot happier than what they are right now out there on the corner somewhere looking for food, looking for covers. Because the other night it was pretty cold. It snowed. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of people out there that's just... 
it really upsets me that they don't have a place to go to. Uh, I'm just happy with the way the process is. And it's important to have people that are working with that process to help other people to get through, but especially um, the, the veterans in the they help me a lot to get where I'm at right now. And I applaud them for what we did. So I'm very happy to be with you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, next is Crystal Rodriguez. Crystal Rodriguez, who's going to talk about, um, she was in Section 8 housing and her experiences with that in a special program that Saha has. Hi, Chris Rodriguez. Um, I got to housing in 2012. Courtney in from McAllen, Texas. I was going through a um, bad situation there. I came over with four kids. And um, I got into housing, and they have, actually they have a lot of programs that I felt that I could try out. Of course, Everybody, those are my best friends. I never, ever thought I could get it, especially by myself with four kids. So I got into housing, I got into a nice home. Um, I went through the program, they have a lot of programs. So, I went to college, I went to, college. I went to school. Um, I went to this program. I did everything they told me, all the classes and everything. I got an internship at a very good company, University of Washington. I actually got a job there in Hawaii. Now I'm making good money, thank God, with my four children. I got to another program, the FFS program, self sufficient program. I was there five years. I did everything they told me the other day. Give me a check. But I won the lottery. Mr. De La O is going to talk about uh, his displacement process. Hello, my name is Benio De La O. I live at the Mission Trail Mobile Home. And, uh, well, at first, it was, uh, I started uh, as homeless. And then I got a um, place, uh, a residence, a friend of mine staying there. But it was a uh, really bad shape house. And uh, he told me, take care of my house. I'm going to Las Vegas and gamble to see if I can get some money. So when he was over there, he died. Because the doctor told him that uh, stop drinking, but he didn't visit the doctor. So when I, I heard that he died and then they were gonna sell the house. So I had applied for housing. And at, at, at that time, I received a letter that I could go into housing. I said, oh, this is a blessing. Now I got a place to yeah, go at. And uh, so I went into housing on a, on a Fair Avenue on apartments. I was there, uh, living there for about five years. And then, uh, I was, because uh, I'm a veteran, I'm a Vietnam veteran. And uh, so I applied for, uh, for uh, different, uh, cases that I have, 
you know. So uh, they stepped up my my check. So they are uh, in the housing was just a little small, small apartment. So uh, I said, why am I paying so much for this little place? So I said, I'm gonna buy me something so I can go home, so I can live at there for the rest of my life and have something that I can own. So I went and uh, to the Mission Trail Mobile Homes and applied there. So they sold me a, a treatment. So I, I started living there. I said, this is the place where I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die here. Because it was next to the San Antonio River and, and I liked the scenery and everything. So after that, living there and then um, we had different managers coming in and out and and then it started getting bad there. And then we had uh, had to move out. We all had to move out. I said, no, I'm not moving. Because um, my um, my trailer house was, uh, it was, I know it was leaking through the walls. I could hear the water into the walls. And then uh, it was running to the floor. And then my medical bed made a hole in the, in the floor. And <laughs> so I had to uh, get some help and get that uh, medical bed out of the way. So they could, uh, my brother could, uh, put a plywood uh, in there, fix it. And, and then we had to move out and they told us, uh, I told them my, my uh, trailer house wasn't movable because it, uh, it was running. And they said, we're gonna send an inspector in there so we can check it out. But when the inspector went in there, it just looked around the ceiling. He said, nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it, it's movable. I said, it's not movable, it's gonna fall apart. And so, um, so I stayed there. I was one of the last ones to move from there. I didn't want to move. So, um, and then I, I had to go to the hospital. I got pneumonia. And then uh, after that, when I came out, uh, one of the representatives of the man, but the, the man, she went over there and asked me uh, what was my problem. And how come I didn't want to move? <clears throat> and I told him, well, why, why should I move if uh, I'm not going to get anything? And I don't, I don't want to move. And it's, it's not going to, it's going to fall apart. The trailer. So after that, uh, I went into uh, the GI forum. Heard about that uh, I was a veteran. So they went over there and. Um, and they talked to me and they said, well, we have a house on the east side that we want to fix up and uh, we'll probably give it to you. So, but uh, you have to stay somewhere. So, uh, uh, um, with that money they gave me, they gave me 2,500. And, and uh, so, I, I bought a, a van and I moved my, my things to the, uh, and, um, what do you call it, you uh, keep your things in there, and, and then, uh, yeah, and, and then after a year, they gave me the house, but it still was, it needs some work on it, I need some, uh, put a, a heater, central heating, that's what I need. So, okay, uh, thank you, and uh, that's all I have, I'm gonna run out of time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Lewis. Our next speaker is uh, Christian Reed Agba. And she's going to talk to you about um, her situation. Good morning. Um, I am an entrepreneur. I and my husband own, oh, oh, sorry about that. I and my husband own um, Ethne East PR LLC, a full service public relations and strategic management firm. Um, five years ago, I relocated to San Antonio from Detroit, Michigan. My husband uh, is a Trinity graduate. We met here in San Antonio. He's also a Nigerian immigrant. Um, we launched our business on necessity, and, and meaning that we could not find 
positions that we feel fit our education here in San Antonio. Um, I think I went on about 150 interviews. And coming from Detroit, where I was a procurement executive, where I had six years at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, and really, really worked hard for my business in 2012 um, to provide public relations, social media management, and all that great, cushy, internet, SEO, all that, all those um, inbound marketing products. Um, our firm has now been listed quite a lot in terms of small business management skills, uh, capabilities, and capacity. But we would not have been able to do that to scale our business from just social media to now full service public relations and corporate event planning had we not moved into a low income housing uh, project on the west side. We moved into the gardens of San Juan Square three years ago, um, and we were absolutely, it wasn't necessarily a last minute option. It, it was a very calculated option. My business was not viable for uh, venture capitalist funding. We didn't want to get small business loans. We were living in a very expensive, Lux apartment downtown at 1221 Broadway. Um, and we, we, we made some decisions to, to kind of uh, give up our comfort for something that was, that was extremely different. We wanted to scale down so that we can scale up. It just so happens that the apartment that we were moving to will be twice the size and half the rent um, for our, from our $1,500 a month um, studio apartment at 1221. We moved into a 972 um, square foot condo on Zarzamora. Um, and we only paid about a little less than $700 a month. We were able to hire six employees. We do about $125,000 in small business vendor sales. So we actually put money back into our area community. We hire small businesses from our area. So our florists, our, our, our caterers, our drivers, if we're bringing cars, all of that comes from our immediate area. We push that money right back into small businesses. Um, we have been, of course, blessed to renew our lease once again, and now we are saving up for, preferably in, in planning, infield development um, to happen right on the west side. So we're scaling, we're looking, we're networking, um, and we're building within our community. And so uh, when we were introduced to the Saha property, of course, it was uh, shared that we would have to fall between different lines, different guidelines of our income, and you know, every entrepreneur is poor, so that was easy. Um, <laughs> and then at the same time, we would have to work along some, some sort of economic development um, program, so we like work alongside WDC, the West Side Development Corp, to uh, create some marketing collateral. We're friends with Lift Fund, so we also work alongside Lift Fund to create some collateral to, to hopefully engage some audience members to, to think of live work units and what a, what a live work unit can provide an entrepreneur. A live work unit allows for us to literally walk downstairs and we're in our office. We are being, we've been allowed, because of the, the cost savings, we can dress that space and decorate that space and it looks really, really cute. You can follow me on Instagram. Um, and we can also utilize that space for different other money-making um, opportunities. So we have a photo booth. We have um, opportunities for folks to come in and teach little classes. We teach typing um, to the students in our in our division because right behind our, our row of live work units is low-income housing. And those uh, are full of uh, single mothers with multiple children, um, Spanish-speaking families. So I'm learning, I'm learning Spanish. So hopefully this is 2018 is all I have a lady that's teaching me Spanish, I'm teaching her thing. So it's a, it's, a, it's a community where we live. One thing we don't have is parking. So sometimes my clients get a little confused, but at the same time, we save so much money, we can kind of coffee, coffee shop hop around the city. There's never a time where I'm not at the Pearl. Um, where I'm not at the Pearl. So we're moving within these communities because we're able to save so much because we're able to, to really plant our roots somewhere. And we really appreciate the housing program for offering that to us. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you as a panelist. This was really, um, it was really, to me it was very moving hearing you all talk. Uh, it's interesting to see what some of the commonalities were, the, the, the struggles that you all have had to, to try and get housing, but because of the benefits of the housing and the things that you can see that you can get when you actually get your housing, you're willing to do the things that you need to do, 
and that there are a lot of programs and services available. And the, the other thing that I noticed that was interesting is that every one of them said they did what they were told to do by the programs. And that's a, a big help also. And the, the, um, the, the one thing that I think is a little bit different with, with this panel is that the live work experience. You know, I think a lot of times we don't think about that with housing. But that's really another whole other aspect of housing that we need to think about. And it's clear that the house, the good housing is a huge benefit for people in so many different ways that a lot of times we sort of take for granted because maybe we're in housing and we, we just are used to it, you know. So anyway, I want to thank all of you, uh, uh, all of you for being here today and sharing your experience. Some of you are not going to stay and some of you need to leave and I really appreciate the fact that you took the time to come here and share your experience and wish you the best of luck with everything that you do. Street. 